Hello and welcome to Conservatory Live. My name is Sarah and I'm so glad to have you here today. I'll be joined by Kristen, our Chief Nursery Specialist here at the Conservatory, actually calling in today from the Conservatory. Uh, Kristen, where are you right now in the Conservatory? A privileged right place now, to be. <laughs> right now I'm in a very lonely and quiet potted plants gallery um, where although we've been closed and don't have visitors here, which we miss dearly, the horticulture staff of four have been able to stay on top of things and haven't missed a day and have been keeping the plants healthy and thriving. Well, thank you so much for doing that. And as part of all of your really hard work, you have successfully produced yet another corpse flower bloom for the conservatory. We've had a few now, but uh, this one is kind of a special one uh, in that Terra the Titan is blooming for the second time, right? So you've uh, seen her through two blooms and uh, how is this plant looking today? The plant looks great. This As of this morning, uh, the plant was still stinky and producing its special fragrance. And um, while the the spathe or the outer bract is, is closing up, um, as you can see in the photo, it still has a beautiful color and shape. It's just a truly elegant, elegant plant. Yeah, it's still looking good. I, I can't believe it's still a little bit stinky today too. Usually we've seen that wane a bit. What, what uh, whiffs are you getting today? Do you have your uh, smelling notes? Um, well, Tim, it always smells something like um you know a decaying live previously li living thing along with a, com a strong compost smell so those two coming together like rotting corpse with compost which right, sure. you know you add the two together and it's particularly um the first morning after the night of the bloom the the we walked into the lowlands gallery so the first, the gallery adjacent to where the plant is right now, and the, the smell was overpowering. It was like, hit you like a wave. <laughs> Amazing. So uh, for those of you tuning in, maybe you are watching the live stream of Tara and you can still tune in and watch this plant as it slowly folds up. This is sort of the last day of the bloom as we know it, uh, although not the end of the story at all for this plant, uh, but the conservatory front doors are still open right now. It's a little smoky out there, I think, but you can get a peek through the plexiglass uh, to see this plant as well uh, this afternoon there. So uh, meanwhile, I beyond this kind of 48 hour event that we have where everyone flocks to this bloom, Kristen, you and your team year round, you are taking care of uh, not just this one corpse flower, but quite a few individuals of this plant that we call the, the Titan Arum. Could you uh, tell us a little more about what it's like to care for these plants and uh, actually how many individuals do you care for? Well, uh, so first of all, the, to start, I'd like to give a shout out to the horticulture team of four of us total who are here 365 days a year. Obviously not all of us on every day, but we cover every day and um, provide skilled care for thousands of plants in the collection. Um, we have, within the collection, we have five mature, that is blooming age, Amorphophallus titanos. Um, some of you might have followed all five blooms and this uh, Terra being the second bloom for Terra. Um, and then we have a number of other, I think about a dozen other species of Amorphophallus, which each have their own unique charm. And m most of them have the delightful fragrance as well when they bloom, yeah. Amazing, so for the last, well, several months since March, you've had no visitors coming in. What's it been like caring for your thousands of incredible plants uh, kind of behind the scenes as essential horticulturists? <laughs> well, it's bizarre a little bit um you know certainly it's it's a little bit like the extension of my lip feeling like the extension of my living room at this point you know we, we encounter each other the four of us and that from time to time otherwise we're we're alone and of course horticulture is like um their isolation to a certain extent so uh we can enjoy that peace and quiet but it got old pretty fast because we grow this collection and care for this collection 
um, we deeply love this collection because of what it can bring to our audiences. So when something happens, something unique or cool or unusual, and we proudly trot it out to the gallery, um, and there's only each other to see it. Um, of course, we've been trying to post as much as we can on social media to with our audiences that way, but we miss, we miss our audience, we miss our volunteers dearly, um, we miss our community. So um, yes, it is unusual to have the kind of time to invest in the galleries. We can scrub every last corner, um, but it still gets old. We miss people for sure. Yeah, I'm sure when we finally do get to reopen, it's going to look spectacular more than ever. So we're really looking forward to that point in time. And in the meantime, as you mentioned, having a broadcast like this and social media gives us a little peer into the galleries. And one thing I wanted to get a little view into today is uh, kind of looking back uh, through the many stages of growth that we see in the corpse flower in between these very brief bloom events, because you're caring for these plants year round, uh, your team, and it probably requires different things at different times in that process. So uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to take us on a little uh, look back in time, uh, sort of what, what we've seen over time with, uh, with this plant. So uh, leading up to the current bloom that we are experiencing, I think it was in early July, you saw this, Kristen, and when you saw this, what did you think? Well, I, I want to credit to um, Bennett, who is a, a intrepid horticulturist here, who cares for our entire Amorphophallus collection, who spotted this bud, this, this, this is the start of a bud coming out of the corn when it was tiny, like maybe a, an inch or two, and and already was speculating that it might be a bloom. There's just, now that we've had um, five blooms behind us, we start to get a sense of when the bud forms, is it is it a leaf coming up or is it a bloom? That's always the mystery and the adventure, but we're starting to get better about spotting that um, there's a little bit of a different shape to the bud when it's a bloom. Uh, of course, we kept in our hats till we were positive, but we started thinking about the possibility of how we could bring this to our audience. Right, so in this case, we were, we were excited to see that it became much bigger bud and then finally the bloom that we've been seeing over the last couple of days. But alternatively, uh, what you might have seen is actually the beginnings of uh, a leaf. And what are we looking at here? We're now in the West Gallery where I believe this leaf is currently developing, right? That's correct. We do have a leaf in the West Gallery. So we have, right now we have two leaves of our three um, mature plants are dormant. One is obviously in bloom terror, and then we have two leaves, one's fully open, and one is, is as you see here, is just pushing its way up. And the, the, the amazing thing about these leaves is they grow inches a day. You can, you know, practically see them growing and um, grow, finally unfurl to a, a, a tree size, almost the size of a small tree, but it is one single leaf. It's absolutely stupendous to see. I almost think I like it as much, if not more than the bloom. The beautiful, absolutely beautiful stately leaves. And unlike the bloom, these last a pretty long while. How long can the plant be in this leaf stage? Uh, several months, um, some I think more than a year even. It varies a little bit. You know, it's still hard for us to predict what will or won't bring that leaf back into dormancy. Uh, but for, in the very least for several months. Wow, so the other stage that we sometimes see this plant in is uh, what we're looking at here, which there are a lot of other small plants in this pot here, so it's still looking vibrant, but underneath the soil, we have what we call the corm of the plant, and when the plant isn't producing a leaf and isn't blooming, this is all we've got, right? What's going on at this point in its development? That's correct, so under the soil, course, what we have is a large storage corm, um, probably, you know, two to two to three feet in width, uh, 50 pounds or more when it's blooming size. And when the leaf dies back or the bloom dies back and the plant goes into dormancy, that corm is, is hanging out with all its storage. Um, being quiet until the next, until something stimulates the next stage of growth. 
Right. So we, your team gets to see this plant through so many different stages of its life. And, and when you or Janet or anyone is uh, paying close attention, how do you have to change the care for the plant through these different stages to make sure that it's healthy? Well, that's a good question. So, you know, let's talk about what plants need for care. And, and the morph is no different from any other plants in our collection. We have to ensure that we're providing for light, water, nutrients, soil, and a climate that's um, as close to the climate that the plant was adapted in as possible. Um, so we provide for that in, in many different, all these different aspects. Um, of course, several of those elements are provided by this ingeniously beautiful and ingeniously engineered building. So by putting these plants under glass, they have their light and then the, the ingenious building um, and our houses back to house as well are engineered to maintain the temperature and humidity that these plants need. So our role is to make sure they're in the right soil mix and that can be shaped to individual plants and to manage that climate and to make sure that we're watering correctly. And that is probably the thing, the variable that changes the most during the life of the plants or from plant to plant is how much we water. And I'm sure those of you that have houseplants out there know that that can actually sound simple, but that can actually be a tricky decision that you make every time you approach the plant. We have all got it wrong on occasion and um, we try to get it right far more. So during the life cycle of the Amorphophallus titanum, we will adjust the watering significantly depending on what stage that plant's at. So obviously when it's a corm and it's in its dormant state and quiet, we want to make sure that we do not keep that soil too wet. We want it to be just moist enough, but not too moist so that um, we don't rot out that corm. And then as the plant, uh, the bud moves forward and, and you start to see a bud emerging from the soil, you actually see roots coming out at the base of that bud. It starts to like fingers going into the soil. You see our root system developing. It's really cool. Um, and we are going to shape our watering depending on how vast that root system is, how much that plant's taking up. The, the bigger the plant, the more surface area when the, when the leaf is grown up and unfurled, there's more surface area for that leaf to lose moisture. That's when we have to make sure that we're watering enough to support it. And of course, that big leaf stalk, that, that petiole is um, full of giant cells filled with water. That's how it gets that that height and, and strength to support that umbrella. So we need to make sure that we are giving that plant enough water to fill all those cells. So we just have to pay attention and check the soil and vary it through the year. Wow, so a lot of uh, paying close attention and intuition and that goes into uh, all of these individual plants. I think we're, we're so focused on the course flower right now, but you're probably thinking about this for you know thousands of different individuals and making sure they all have it just right. So what an incredible feat. And uh, one other thing that I, I mentioned, uh, have to mention from your experience is that with these plants producing these huge leaves a lot of the time and it, figuring out where to put them is one other challenge you face, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's correct. We have to make sure when we place particularly when the leaves are merging. Well, actually for both, with the, with the leaves emerging, we have to make sure that we place the plant as that bud is small before it's grown too big to fit through a door. We have to place it where we're sure that the plant has room to fully grow and emerge and unfurl and live out its life in a healthy way, live out that life cycle within a healthy way before it goes dormant. With the bloom, we also are trying to be strategic to make sure that we think about our audience and their ability to to view the plant. So for instance, this is the first time we've had it right in front of our front doors, but being closed, that seemed like the best place to place it where, you know, the, the visitors to the park, which have been many, um, can see it through its development. Great. And we've been so lucky to get to see it through all of the stages. And speaking of those stages, we have a couple of questions from our viewers that I hope we can answer. Um, this is sort of about the, these changes over time. One question was how long does the corm live overall? Ooh, yeah. That's a really good question. And I don't know if anyone has an answer to that. As 
these plants have not been in cultivation for a very long time. And there isn't a lot of information yet about them in their natural environment. But um, I do think that most of the mature corms in, in cultivation in collections like ours are still around and they're just getting bigger and bigger. Um, also, we're taking out of its environment, so who knows if it'll live longer in the wild than in our spaces. Uh, a lot of our spaces, because these these plants need to be grown under glass, you know, their their ultimate size might determine how long we can keep them in a collection. So, it's kind of something I look forward to seeing is how long and and how big and how vast we can get these plants to grow. So, still a mystery on that one. Yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> um, another question was uh, when will the spadex fall? Maybe we should uh, go back to what is the spadex? Here's our live stream here. Uh, we've got that large kind of yellowish structure now in the center of the plant. And that is the the smell generator also at the very base of it where the flowers are, but, but uh, it, it will fall. Can you explain what happens next and what we can expect over the next few days for this plant? Well, ultimately what will happen is this, this bloom has um, done its work and the male and the female flowers have gone through their receptive phase and possibly the pollination will on the female flowers or not. Um, and then the, the spadix will basically collapse. It will deflate almost and collapse into itself. And uh, if the female flowers have the pollination was successful, then they might start producing fruit. Looks like little, almost little red berries. Um, we'll see if that happens or not. Uh, but so far, we haven't had a fruit set, so I'm not sure. Yeah, you, you can see in this picture here. Yeah, that's right. We did get a little bit of fruit set at the base of that was the Tara's first bloom, right, Sarah? I think so. And and. I don't remember whether we actually, I don't think we got to seed there, but we did get to a stage where we got some some berries. So the top of the, so you can see in this is top of the spadix where all the male flowers would be collapses and falls apart. And then you're left with just um, the rest of the plant, the rest of the bloom, which could potentially produce seed. And then it'll, it'll mature on the spot and get dispersed from there, probably in nature by birds or some other pollinator that finds those tasty, those fruits tasty. Yeah. Speaking of, of in nature, I think our very last broadcast, which is coming up at 7 p.m. today, here is a, a little trip to Sumatra, which is where this plant's native habitat is, to talk a little bit more about where it's from and the conservation of the incredible place where it grows, because this is an endangered species. So it's a victory for us to have it growing here at the conservatory, so we can share it with all of you, but we want to uh, bring everyone back to uh, that uh, place where there are so many other animals that it depends on that depend on it, such as maybe those birds that are picking up those seeds. All right, well, Kristen, I think we may have lost you. Uh, so uh, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us and to all of you out there who are as well. Um, as I mentioned, we have one more broadcast at 7 p.m. today. The conservatory continues to be open this afternoon in, in that our front doors are open and we're uh, at a safe distance allowing folks to walk up to the plexiglass and see this bloom. Uh, and uh, Kristen, it looks like you're back. So thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, and thank you of all, all of you who've been tuning in. We really appreciate your support of the conservatory, your curiosity, um, and uh, thank you for contributing to make sure we can keep these plants thriving, uh, support all of our staff uh, who bring this incredible education to you and to Kristen's team who takes care of our collection. Uh, so there's a donation link in the uh, com just below this video that you can check out. Uh, otherwise, uh, we hope to see you soon. We hope to reopen soon. Uh, and uh, thanks so much. Have a great afternoon. And thanks again, Kristen. And Thank thanks to the whole horticulture team. We really appreciate you all.